So welcome back. What we're going to do now is we're going to choose a random map and get it loaded into the game so that the player can be teleported later on. So let's begin. Don't forget, if you're new to my channel, then click on the notification bell and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out when I upload a brand new video. So what we're going to do is we're going to firstly get the maps okay, from this maps folder. So we can say local available maps equals and then we can say maps folder colon get children with a pair of brackets on the end. This is going to return a table, okay? And the table looks like this, and it's just a list of all of the different maps that we can choose from. So it might be desert for one, grass for another, and we're going to make it pick a random number from one to however many entries we have in this table. So there's two entries, so we're going to want to pick one of two. And because in a table, each item is attributed to a number. So desert is the first item in the table, so it's starts at position one okay so this one is position one and we have position two and the value of position two is grass so if number two was picked then it would be the grass map if number one was picked it would be the desert map you get the idea so what we're going to do is we've got our table and we want to find a random map from this table so we can do local chosen map equals available maps and then when we want to get something from a table, we do square brackets and we put the number. OK, so if we wanted desert, we would put one. If we wanted grass, we would put two. But we want a random number. So what we can put in here is math.random and then a pair of normal brackets or parentheses, however you want to say it. And we want to pick a random number from one. So that's the first number. Then we do comma to show that we want to now do the second number. And the number we want to go up to is however many maps we have. So an easy way to find out how many maps you have is to put a hashtag and then available maps. And that will give you the number of items in the available maps table. So if there are three maps, then hashtag available maps will be three. So we're picking a map in the maps table from one to three. OK, so if there were three values, it'd be one to three. If there were ten maps, it would be one to ten. You get the idea. So chosen map will be the model of the chosen map so what we can do is we can say status dot value equals chosen map dot name and then we want to put chosen okay so we want to concatenate here so we want to put two things together we have the name of our map which we don't know and we also have chosen which is in speech marks so this is a string and we want to concatenate this together so put the two together and to do that we put two dots or periods in between the two things we want to put together. So concatenate basically means put together. So we're putting the name of the map together with chosen to show that a specific map has been chosen. So now that we've done that, what we can do is we can clone this map and put it into the workspace so that we can teleport players to that map. So local cloned map, once again, we're doing another variable equals chosen map colon clone with a capital C for clone doesn't really matter but it is good practice to use capital C and remember put a pair of brackets parentheses on the end of uh, that because it's an inbuilt function to clone something and we want to say cloned map dot parent equals you can just say workspace you could say game dot workspace um, but it is acceptable to put workspace so we want to now teleport players to that map. Now remember in part one where we created our map and we added the spawn points, what we're going to do is we're going to index every single spawn point and teleport each player to one of those specific spawn points. So go back to the main script and what we're going to do is we're going to say local spawn points equals cloned map because we're not using the chosen map, we're using the one that we cloned and we want to say colon find first child and then in brackets, in speech marks, we're going to say spawn points. So we're just telling the map to look for these spawn points here. Find first child will send back the first item it sees, which is called spawn points. So these spawn points, we're going to just check to see if you actually have the spawn points in your map. So if not spawn points, then it should print, you do not have, actually we could just print spawn points not found. 
Now, this shouldn't run, but if you see spawn points not found in your output window at the end, that means that you haven't put spawn points in your map. So double check that and make sure that the spawn points is spelt correctly. Everything looks like mine. This is just a little way to check to see if you've done it right. Although you don't need to add it in, but we'll keep it in anyway. So we now want to do the same things we did with the maps. We want to find the spawn points that are available because we don't want to teleport people to the same spawn point. So we can say local available spawn points equals spawn points colon get children. Okay, oh, oh, with a pair of brackets or parentheses on the end. And that is going to return, as I said earlier, another table. Okay, so this is our table and we might have multiple spawns in here. And so we have spawn point because they're all called spawn point, don't forget. Okay, but imagine that all these spawn points are at different positions in the map. So we have one, we have two, we have three, we have four, we have five. Okay, so imagine we have five spawn points. We're going to choose a random number from one to five, and then whichever spawn point gets chosen, we will teleport that specific player to that spawn. We'll then remove it from the table, Okay, this, the available spawn points table, so that nobody else can get teleported to that spawn. And then when everyone has been teleported, then the game can begin. Now, I need to stress that you need to have more spawns than the number of players in your game. If you have six players in your game, but only five spawns, then one person isn't going to get teleported because there won't be enough spawn points left. So make sure you have enough spawn points. I recommend you do double because, you know, Roblox might mess up the servers and give you more than your allocated amount. So if your server size is five, Roblox might mess up and give you seven or eight because the servers might get overloaded or you might accidentally bump up the server count and forget to update the spawns. So make sure you have enough spawns for everyone in your game else it won't work. So we've got children, we've got the children, we've got all the spawn points now in this table. All we need to do is loop through each player in the players table we made earlier. So we can say for i, comma, player, in pairs, and in these brackets, the table that we're going to loop through is the players table, so plrs, do. And for each player, we want to check to see if they still exist. So if player then, and if the player is there, then we want to firstly get their character. So character equals player.character. Now, the player might have left the game already, so we need to see if the if the player still exists. And if there isn't a character, which is their their model, their actual player that you see in the game, if not character, then well, actually, let's let's just say if character first. So if there is a character, we'll do code to teleport them. Else, there is no character. Okay, maybe they reset, maybe their character got destroyed, something happened, but there is no character. So we need to check to see if they're still in the game. Because this is a warning sign that we need to kick them out of the table. Because if they've already left, we don't want them to win just because they're sitting there in the table being inactive. So what we're going to do is we're just going to check to see if not player, then... So if the player isn't there, then we know that they've left the game. So we can remove them from the player's table. So, because it's inevitable that somebody is going to leave the game during the game, okay? Rage quit, for, for starters. Okay, so if someone leaves the game, they're going to still be in the table, and the, the, the script, the game, is still going to think that they're in the game, because they've left, but they're still in this table. So we need to constantly be checking to see if they've left the game yet. And if they have, we're going to do table, dot remove, and then we're going to specify the player's table, and then the... The number, remember I said earlier about the numbers being attributed to each item in the table. We need to find their number, okay, because you can't just say player.remove and put their username in, okay? It doesn't work like that, okay? You can't do that. You have to say the number at which they exist. So, now, luckily, because we're already looping through this player's table, we know what number we're already at. Because if we've got to this current player, we know that their number is i, because i is the number of times or, or the current table index we loop through. So if player is, is the fourth object in the table, i is going to be four by the time we get around to looping through to them. So what we need to do is we just need to say players, comma, i, okay? because i is the number where they are in the table. For loop has done it for us. So now that we've removed them from the table, we can actually work on teleporting them if they're still in the game. So what we need to do 
is we need to say character colon find first child humanoid root part. Now the humanoid root part is a part that exists in the player and it will work for all body types R6, R15, Anthro because R16 and R15 are different. You can't tell whether someone is R6 or R15. Well, you can, but that'll take a lot more code. So if it was R6, you'd have to teleport their torso. If it was R15, you'd have to move their lower torso or upper torso because there's no such thing as a torso in R15. But R6, R15 and Anthro have a part called a humanoid root part. So it doesn't matter what body type they are, we can just change the position of the humanoid root part and their whole character will follow with them. And we're just getting the first humanoid root part that we see. And we can say dot C frame equals available spawn points. And we want to get the first object in this table. Now, we're not getting a specific spawn point because we're teleporting one player to the spawn point. Okay, so let's say we teleport the first player to the first object in the spawn points table. And then we remove whatever's at position one from the table. So that spawn point is going to be gone. So all the other spawn points at position two, three, four, five, six are going to move along and shift along one space so that the spawn point in position two will shift into position, position one. So there's always going to be a spawn point at position one, no matter what. So we don't need to worry about getting a specific spawn point. What we just need to do is say dot C frame. So that is the position of the spawn point and we're teleporting the player's humanoid root part to that C frame. Okay, so if we just go into a game, I just want to show this to you. Right, okay, we're loaded into the game. Now I'm going to go into the workspace, go into my player and you can see we've got upper torso, right? lower torso okay but you can see you've got this humanoid root part now if we move the humanoid root part to a different position say 78 and let's just move ourselves you can see my entire body moves with the part so that's why we're moving the humanoid root part so now that we've teleported the player we need to remove that spawn point from the available spawn points table so that no one else can be teleported to that spawn point. And as I said, all the other spawn points can shift down. So we can say of table.remove available spawn points, comma, and then one. Because as I said, we're dealing with the first object in the table to make it simpler. We're always teleporting to the first object, removing that first object, so they all shift down and we'll have the object in first position for the next person. So there we go. We have teleported the player. All that's left is to give them a sword and we can move on to the actual game getting started, seeing if everybody's died and we can give out rewards later on. So let's go ahead and do that now. We're going to, we're just going to give them a sword. And as I said earlier, we've got this sword in server storage here. And it's also going to be in the description. So you just need to go to the link in the description. Then you need to take that model. So purchase it. And then go into your toolbox. And then if you click on my models, it should be there. Okay, my models. And you can click it, insert it into your game and drag it into server storage. Right, so... What we're going to do is we're going to give them the sword. So we can say local sword equals server storage dot sword colon clone. We're copying, we're basically making a clone of it, copying the sword. I'm going to say sword dot parent equals player dot backpack. And this will put it in their inventory so that they can equip the sword and fight other people with it. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to insert something called a game tag. Now, a game tag is what we use to track how many players are left in the game. Because when the game starts, we want to know how many players are left from that original players table because we want to know who's died. And because this is a uh, last man standing, we want to make sure that we reward whoever is the last person standing. So we'll have a game tag and we'll insert this tag into the player's character. And when they die, we're going to remove this tag. And then when we do the, the for loop for when the game is running, every second we will check each player to see if they have a game tag. And if they don't, we will remove them from the player's table. And eventually, when there's one player left in the player's table, we'll know that one person is left standing. So what we can do is end the game, give them some reward and move on to the next game. So that's why we're using a game tag. It's basically a value which is going, which is going to go into the player's character and you'll see more how it works in a minute. So to do this, we're just gonna say local game tag equals instance.new. 
bool value, although it could be any type of value, we're not using the, the value type, we're just inserting this tag so that we can reference it later on in the script to show that they're still in the game. Anyone still in the, anyone, anyone still in the game will have this game tag. Anyone that's died won't have it because we will remove it. So we can see who's still in the game and who is dead. So we can say game tag dot name equals game tag with capital G and capital T and game tag dot parent equals player dot character. Okay, this is why it's so important to check if the character's there. Because if there isn't a character, this script is going to break because there is no character. No character has been found. How can we insert a game tag into the player's character if there isn't a character? So that's why we do the if statement to check to see if the character's there. And if it is, we can run this code. But in case it isn't there, which could happen because they could leave the game, we can remove them from this table and move on to the next person in the for loop. So now that we've inserted the game tag, we can get started on the actual game mechanic so that we can count down from our game length and constantly check to see if there's one player left standing. So what we'll do is we'll do that in the next part of the video. But just to finish this one off, we're just going to do a little bonus and add the GUI so that you can see the status value in action. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a nice little GUI which shows the current status so it will update for all players. Now I'm going to be using a plugin for this called Roundify. I'm going to leave a link to it in the description down below if you want to use it. You don't have to. All it's going to do is make our GUIs look really nice and smooth. So we're going to go and come plugins. We're going to go to manage plugins and we're going to click on find plugins. And once that's loaded, we're going to go to search and we're going to click on search when it loads up and type in roundify and click on roundify by Stellrex. Click on install and that's going to install it into our Roblox studio. So just wait for that and it should come up saying, yep, installed. And you can see roundify has been added. So we're going to go into starter GUI because that's where all of the GUI graphical user interface elements are made and we can click on the plus and insert a screen GUI. We're just going to call this screen GUI a status. And then we're going to click on text label. OK, text label is a GUI element which allows you to show text on the screen. So the user can't click it. It's not a button. It just shows text. So we're going to take this label, click it and we're going to scroll down here and set the position to 0.5 minus 100 because that's half of the size, which is 200, 0, 50, okay? Now that puts it in the middle of our screen. And actually, let's just go ahead and make this a little bit bigger. I'm going to set it to 500, and then we can change this minus 100 to minus 250, because that is half of 500. If you're having a bit of trouble with this, you don't know what I'm doing here. I'm just positioning it. 0.5 puts it in the middle of the screen, and negative 250 is the offset, so that it sets it back 250 pixels so that it is truly in the middle and you can see on all devices it's in the middle and then here 0 50 we're just putting it 50 pixels down the screen from the top so if that was a bit confusing you can just drag it around but this method is better for it appearing on all devices because you can now see if we go into test emulator you can see it scales pretty good on all devices so you can see iphone x works fine so yes there you go what we want to do now is just go down to properties click on text scaled uh, so that the text becomes nice and big and you can change the text if you want uh, it doesn't matter though because that's not going to be shown when the game starts so all that's left to do is roundify this so we can click on plugins roundify and you can see the GUI, cur it's got nice curved edges and looks much cleaner. Now you'll have to go back to text label and set Z index to 2. Uh, that just makes it appear on top of the image label. If you can't see your text, set the Z index to 2. So there you go. Uh, if Roundify isn't working for you, then don't use it. Uh, maybe in future if it's broken, although I don't think it's broken, or it gets updated. It might be a little bit different, but that's how it is today. Um, so that is how you do the GUI design. Now we just need to do the, the actual coding of it, which 
doesn't take long. So we're going to insert a local script into this text label, not a normal script, a local script, uh, because it's local to the client, to that player. So what we're going to do is we're going to firstly create a variable for our status. So we can say local status equals game colon get service replicated storage because that's where it's stored. Colon wait for child status. Remember we're waiting for it to be added because the script might already be running, executing uh, before the status has been added into the game. So now that we've got that, we can just say script dot parent dot text equals status dot value. Now this is updating it when they first join the game. But what about when the status value changes? Because it's bound to change. So we have to make sure that when it changes, we have a function that we can fire off to update the text. So it's quite simple. We just need to say status, colon, get property, changed signal. And the property that we want to update the text when it's changed is value. So when the value of status changes, we're going to update the text label. So we can say colon connect function function like this, drop a couple of lines and say script dot parent dot text label dot text equals status dot value. Now, just a quick reminder, guys, make sure that you've saved your project. Click on file and then click on save as make sure it's saved in case something bad happens. You can get it back and let's go ahead and test this out. So we're heading into the game. So there we go, we're in the game and you can see the status bar has been updated because the first time we joined the game, it set the text to whatever the status currently is, which is waiting for enough players. Now, if we go ahead and change this status, okay, on the server. So imagine this is the script that goes in and changes this status. Okay. And we press enter and we go back. Uh, right, let's have a look. Okay, so it's not it's not actually changing. Okay, so let's go into the output here. And we've got an error. Okay, and this is fine. And it says text label is not a valid member of text label. Let's go back to the local script to see what happened. It's on line seven. And it says script.parent.textlabel.text. Aha, so there's our issue. What I did was I put the local script in the text label, but I accidentally said script parent dot text label okay but the text label already is the parent because it's inside so if we get rid of that text label and retry everything should be all good so that is what you do if you find an error you go into the output you have a look where it is you try and fathom out what's going wrong and you try and fix it so let's go back into the replicated storage let's change it to hello and there you go you can see that the status has changed. Now, uh, usually the, the server would update this, but if a client or a player tried to change this to exploit the server, only they would see it, okay? So let's imagine I'm a hacker, okay? And I'm changing this value to goodbye, okay? You can see it's changed for me, but if we switch to the server and we go in here, you can see it still says waiting for enough players. It didn't even say hello because we changed that on the client as well. So you don't need to worry about that too much. That's quite advanced, but we have got our status bar working now and we should be ready to go on to scripting the actual game in the next part. So make sure that you subscribe to my channel already. If you haven't, make sure you've turned on the notification bell and you've liked these videos to let me know that you want more. If you want to go straight to part three, which I do recommend, you should click on the video thumbnail on your screen now, and I will see you over there in part three.